Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Groot Nibblink. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. And in this podcast, I'm going to go over the most puzzling players league wide as submitted by the Apples and Genos Discord server. Let's get it. Right, welcome in everybody. Leave me some comments. I see these people in here. Leave me some comments. Let's get this thing rolling here tonight. Good to see some eyeballs in here. I've been having some weird mic things going on, so let me know if the the mic is acting up. I've got a few more livers I can pull if uh, if there's something going on, but I think I get it sorted out. We are going to get into some puzzling players, as you already know, as you can already see. If you're watching over on YouTube, watching the live stream here, we're going to be talking about a lot of interesting things. We might do a little scoreboard watching. we got uh, only two games tonight, and everybody's got a piece of these teams with how few off nights there are in the NHL this week. Everybody's got a little piece of these two games, so everybody's going to be watching these games going on for sure. My opponent in one of my playoff matchups picked up David Riddick, I assume, thinking hopefully that he would get the start against Vancouver, and then Talbot got announced. This is fantastic stuff. You absolutely love to see it. We got Toronto David here, hashtag zero G. Good to see you, buddy. New feeds is in here as always. Nate, you're a beauty. That's all. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your service. Laura's in here. My first live episode. Love your quantitative work. I appreciate that somebody appreciates the quantitative work. Uh, not many do, but uh, we got 24 people in here already, and I assume we'll fill up. So good to see all of you. Good to see some people appreciating some quantitative work as well. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right in with the first and most requested player in the Apples and Geos Discord server, Andrei Svechnikov. Two assists his last five games. It's not been ideal for Svechnikov. What seems to have been Jake Gensel's gain has been Andrei Svechnikov's loss in some ways. His minutes have come down in the last game against Toronto on Sunday. He played just 14-38. He did have five shots in that game, so that's obviously good, but he hasn't scored a goal in six straight, and he's only got two assists in that time frame. 16 uh yeah roughly what is that 16 minutes 20 seconds average time on ice somewhere in that range over the last five games here 59th in shots per 60 pretty solid 100th 100th in individual scoring chances four per 60 31st Corsi four per 60 123 in on ice scoring chances four per 60 on the season now pacing for 27 goals 74 points I feel like that's probably not that far off from where I had Sveshnikov, probably with a few more goals and a few less assists, but the point total seems about right. Look at that, Corsi 4 on the season ninth overall. Pretty good stuff from Sveshnikov, and he has the 69% IPP, which is pretty nice. 13.8% shooting percentage, 11.8% on ice shooting percentage. None of this seems too crazy for Sveshnikov. Overall, I'm kind of inclined to think that this is a player that he is. Obviously, I think what people are really Really after is should we expect something different from Svechnikov now that we have Jake Gensel in town and Evgeny Kuznetsov for that matter they've moved their lines around uh, as of the last game Gensel was on the line with Aho and Jarvis and Svechnikov was with Kuznetsov and Nietzsche uh, Svechnikov still on the top power play with Gensel Aho and Jarvis up front Overall, I think that, you know, the shots are still there. The on-ice numbers look solid. Uh, it's just kind of a cold stretch uh, for Svechnikov, obviously not coming at a great time. It's not when we would want uh, this to happen for a guy like Andre Svechnikov in the middle of our fantasy playoffs. There's maybe a case where you might bench Svechnikov uh, if you have a really strong team. But overall, I'm, I'm not that concerned. Uh, the underlying metrics are solid. It's fair to say that maybe we ex 
expect a little bit less. Like on the season, he's, for most of the season even, I would say he's been pacing for about a point per game, and obviously that's fallen off in the last little bit here. So maybe somewhere in this 70-point range is the new point pace that we should consider. I think that's a fair assessment to make that Gensel might hurt him overall. Uh, just by virtue of taking perhaps a few minutes away from him that he might otherwise get, perhaps taking away some of that Sebastian Ajo exposure that he might otherwise get. Overall, I think Svechnikov is still a great player and one that you're going to be happy to have on your roster through the fantasy playoffs. All right, we got to get back to some comments. Agent Orange, what up, Nate? Much love from Canada. Toronto Dave throwing up the Canada flag. And Agent Orange, as an owner of both Svech and Gensel, it's been a confusing time. Uh, that would be to say the least. Uh, what you really hope doesn't happen is that they kind of cannibalize each other and you end up with neither of them performing uh, super well. Hopefully it's just one and then the other at, at the very least. But uh, yeah, hopefully that works out for you for sure. FF Tyler O, a Nate big fan of the work. Martin LaPointe worth a stash. Um, yes, obviously. Martin LaPointe, uh, one of the great... What I'm curious now. I'm going to have to Google this because Martin LaPointe, I have a feeling, had a couple of 20-goal seasons in him back in the day. Martin LaPointe, let's check out some career stats for Martin LaPointe. He had... Oh, it was only one. He had one 27-goal season. 27 goals, 57 points, 127 penalty minutes for the Detroit Red Wings back in 2000-2001. What an absolute beauty Martin LaPointe must have been for you, Tyler, back in the day. Uh, Jordan's in here as well. Hey, Nate, what's your outlook on Jarvis now that he's line one with Ajo Gensel? Honestly, I don't think it changes all that much. I guess I would probably say that Gensel is a slightly better offensive talent than Svechnikov, but it's very close. So overall, I don't think it's a big change for Jarvis other than, you know, uh, like Jarvis's deployment throughout much of the season has been on the top line with Aho and with Svechnikov for a good chunk of it. So to move to Jarvis, uh, to move, sorry, from Svechnikov over to Gensel uh, is not really moving the needle in a significant way. Obviously, Carolina moves the lines around, so Jarvis has been off that line and now he's back on that line. So uh, being on the top line with Ajo and Gensel is obviously a great place to be. I think that you can expect pretty solid stuff from Seth Jarvis overall. We can throw him in the sheet here and get a look at his recent numbers. They are solid, not spectacular, but he's been skating over 20 minutes a night and obviously has five goals in his last five games, which is what you want to see. So I think that that's pretty good stuff for Seth Jarvis, obviously. I think you're happy to have him. He's hot right now, hot at a good time in the fantasy playoffs. You're going to love it. That's my take on Seth Jarvis. I Yeah, I do think like he's not a guy I'm considering dropping right now, just given how hot he's been and how well it seems to be working out at the moment. Victor Arvidsson was hotly requested as well. Uh, he obviously hasn't been playing a whole ton of games as of late, but the Sheets got him with two goals and or two points rather in his last couple of games here. I can pull up uh, an actual game log to look back a little bit more closely. He had five shots in the one game, one shot in the other game. He had his goal and assist in that six nothing win against Minnesota, and then nothing in seven eighteen against Tampa Bay. Yeah, I think that's probably a relatively unsurprising thing for any LA player. They they seem to just kind of have great games, and then it'll be another line that goes off in the next game, and uh, they just kind of trade things around. And I think that's probably what I would expect overall. I I don't really see much reason for them to change a whole lot. He was on the Dubois and Laferriere line in the last game. Um, had a decent amount of even strength exposure there, and then also was on the top power play unit, the Kopitar Fiala Kempe unit in place of Quentin Byfield. So that makes him an interesting play from that perspective. Obviously, we've got the shots ranks here, but it's just two games. It's obviously a little bit hard to draw too much from that small of a sample size, but it's nice that he had at least the one five shot game in there, showing he's definitely still capable of all that. Uh, I do like Arvidsson as, you know, a stream for the night, uh, but are you hanging on to him really beyond tonight? You know, looking ahead, we talked a little bit about this, Blake and I, about what we're doing with some of these players beyond this uh, Monday off night that LA has here against Vancouver tonight. 
But uh, yeah, they've got Edmonton on Thursday. They've got Calgary on Saturday, both extremely heavy nights. I don't know if Arvidsson is really going to crack your starting lineup through there. Then next week, they've got four games um, being played, and they're on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um Next week is a much better streaming schedule. Even the Saturday heavy night, I believe it's only 11 games played on the Saturday night, and that's the heaviest night of the week. So there's a pretty solid chance that you're actually getting all four games out of Arvidsson next week. But I still don't know if that makes it worthwhile hanging on to him if there are legitimate options to be had. Like, I would definitely drop Arvidsson in most setups for, like, uh, Jordan Greenway, for example, uh, from Buffalo, even though that's a pretty big stretch to say that he's going to have a massive impact at least he's going to have some impact whereas Arvidsson is not going to have any if he's just warming your bench on those two heavy nights later this week so um, that's my take I don't think Arvidsson is a player that you have to hang on to just because uh, LA has four games next week there are a lot of teams that have four games next week that you could move on to from Arvidsson so that's my take there E. Dangler says, is Eric Carlson a hold? We can take a quick look at Eric Carlson and his stats. He's got just one assist in his last five games, still getting lots of deployment, almost 25 minutes a night. Fourth amongst all defensemen, shots per 60, 18th individual scoring chances, four per 60. Fifth in Corsi, four per 60. Seventh in on-ice scoring chances, four per 60. Pacing for 54 points on the season. This has really just been a microcosm of Carlson's season so far. Underlying number is looking really good 47 percent ipp which is respectable but not as good as you would think for a player of carlson's caliber 4.5 percent shooting percentage very low for a guy of carlson's talents and the 8.9 percent on ice shooting percentage just atrocious uh, i don't think i need to explain to anyone how pittsburgh's season has gone this year the underlying numbers looking really good but i it's hard for me to hold out a ton of hope for carlson that being said i really do question who you're going to pick up who's going to be all that much better um yeah if you can if you can give me an idea of who you might be who might be available in your league that you would want to pick up maybe i can tell you if i do think that's worthwhile pittsburgh again one of these teams that has four games next week a lot of teams do uh, but pittsburgh does have four games next week this week they do have the tuesday thursday saturday three games no off night schedule but two of those are against columbus so you think they might be able to get some points there uh some goals on the board anyway uh, overall, I think it's hard to find somebody who's a better bet for points than Eric Carlson just sitting out there in the waiver wire that you're actually going to get games played from. Um, like, apparent, like most likely, you're probably looking at a defenseman to replace Carlson and his games played. And I significantly doubt that there's somebody out there who's going to be an upgrade on Carlson. Maybe in like a bangers cats, you could just change Carlson into like an all out bangers guy and just try to win your hits and blocks categories or something like that. That might be a scenario that you might consider if there is somebody compelling who could do that for you. But Carlson, I, I just don't know who's out there that's actually better a better bet for scoring some points for you this week than eric carlson is so that's my take there let's move back into the list let's talk about the other pittsburgh defenseman chris letang he's got two assists his last five also skating just under 25 minutes a night his underlying metrics not nearly as good 75th shots per 60 110 individual scoring chances four per 60 74th in Corsi, four per 60 60th in on ice scoring chances four per 60 on pace for nine goals, 48 points, pretty similar numbers to Carlson, actually. Um, 46% IPP, 5.6% shooting percentage, 9.4% on ice shooting percentage. Um, all of that looks pretty normal. Like, I think this is a 50-point player, 50-point defenseman. Pittsburgh in general is cold. You are le you would have a legitimate worry with any Pittsburgh player right now that they're just kind of throwing in the towel and it's going to be hard for them to get motivated about this season, what's left of this season for them and that they might uh, just kind of coast this one out. Uh, that's a very real possibility for a great number of Penguins players. Uh, so that is concerning. But again, like even like 
talking about with Carlson that you might move to somebody who's a bangers player. Chris Letang is a bangers guy, right? He's one of those guys who will throw the body around and get you some of those peripheral categories and help you out even when he's not scoring points. Um, so that part, I don't think you're gaining a huge advantage by moving off. And he's still a guy who's skating 25 minutes a night. Who are you going to find who's skating this kind of deployment and is scoring at a 50 point pace on the season? I don't know that there's many of those guys out there that you're actually going to be able to fit into your lineup this week. So I feel like Chris Letang is most likely a hold unless you know you're just uh, completely stacked at the position and he's going to be your fifth guy and on your bench for all the heavy nights this week. Richard asks, have a bye this week in a bangers cats add Zuccarello for next week would be dropping Schmaltz or McTavish. Um, in bangers cats Zuccarello is not that enticing to me. Um, definitely he's yeah, he's he's one of those guys, right? He's not going to throw a ton of hits or get you a bunch of blocks. And he's mostly assists, so he's really only helping you out a whole ton in one category there in most cases. So overall, I'm not like... I can't say I'm through the roof about the, the player in Zuccarello. So that's my, that's my general take on Zuccarello. You know, he was back up with the, on the Kaprizov line with Marco Rossi in the last game. So that's obviously a good sign for him. Um, I'm trying to think how much I really believe in Matt Zuccarello. I guess we should throw him in the sheet. Let's get the numbers. Let's let the numbers do some talking for us on the Zucchini man. He's got just two assists, his last five, skating 20 minutes a night. That's pretty good. Uh, shots per 60, individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Honestly, not bad for a guy like Zuccarello. The on-ice number is really good. Obviously, playing with Kaprizov can do that for you and playing on a top power play. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, I'm just not excited about Zuccarello. There, maybe if, uh, like, he is basically Nick Schmaltz. Uh, I feel like Nick Schmaltz and, and Matt Zuccarello feel very similar. Zuccarello, obviously, exposure to a better player in Kaprizov, better superstar in Kaprizov than Schmaltz has. Maybe that's an edge that you could give to Zuccarello right now. But again, how safe is he in that deployment? We've seen Boldy get that uh, look on that top line for a good stretch as well. Uh, the Wild, one of these four-game teams for next week. If he fits in on all your heavy nights, then you're getting the four games from him. And that feels pretty good. But uh, yeah, you would have to be getting the four games and he would have to be a distinct upgrade in my mind. If the off nights from Arizona help you more in that regard, then I wouldn't drop Schmaltz for him because I do think the players are somewhat similar in terms of upside. And as far as McTavish goes, I'm really not into McTavish right now. Um, I could throw him in the, in the sheet right now as well, but it's hard to get excited about McTavish. Nick Tavish when he's putting up a bunch of zeros the underlying metrics look like this 345th in shots per 60 uh, just not doing a whole heck of a lot out there maybe still nursing some sort of injury at the moment and we've got Trevor Zegris coming back um, we could jump through we've got a bunch of ducks on this uh, on this puzzling players docket here and while I may not know what a duck is I think we should still talk about them so let's do all that right now let's talk about McTavish let's talk about Terry, Zegris, and Vitrano, all these guys we can get through here. So yeah, my general take on McTavish is I'm not excited. I know he's, you know, getting to play a fair bit with guys like Terry and, and things like that. In the last game, he was playing with Vitrano and Strom. You know, could be worse. I'd rather him play with Terry, obviously. Terry, I still think, is by far the best player in Anaheim, but uh, could be worse. Uh, Vitrano is definitely a guy who can shoot a ton of pucks and some will go in, so McTavish could run into some points that way overall just not that excited on mason mctavish he hasn't done he hasn't shown a lot of signs of life i feel like the points that he gets are just going to be by virtue of getting a bunch of minutes and frank vitrano bouncing some pucks off him uh, from time to time so overall i'm not into mctavish as a pickup really if there's any other compelling options, I would go that route. Troy Terry, I still like. I'm never going to be able to quit Troy Terry. 19 and a half minutes, average time on ice, two goals, three points in his last five. 156 shots per 60, 298 individual scoring chances, four per 60. Not great. 
142nd Corsi 4 per 60, 208 in scoring chances, 4 per 60. It's a 62-point pace on the season for Troy Terry, which is actually pretty good when you consider how incredibly cold he was at the start of the season for him to get all the way back up here is uh, pretty solid stuff, uh, especially given the supporting cast or lack thereof in Anaheim. So I like Terry. Uh, I would like to hang on to him through this week. I don't know that he's playing over a lot of other players for you this week, which is why some people might be dropping him. And I do think that, yeah, like we've said a million times on the podcast over the last couple of weeks, you do need to be ruthless in your fantasy hockey playoffs. Even if you like the guy, even if you got some a strange emotional attachment to him, as I do with Troy Terry, you can absolutely drop him if there is something that's going to get you some games played, going to bring you closer to winning your matchup this week. I would not fault you for dropping Troy Terry. Uh, as far as it goes with Trevor Zegris, it sounds like he's getting pretty close. They were talking about even a game time decision for the game yesterday. So, it seems like Zegris's return is imminent, and honestly, I would be fairly shocked if he doesn't come straight back into a fair amount of work. Maybe not the very first game, but like pretty soon he's going to be leaned on a fair bit because what they have right now is not working. So unless uh, they're just going to bring him back and have him play like 13 minutes randomly, I would be kind of surprised if Segrist doesn't get a fair amount of work coming back like 18 plus minutes would be my expectation I could obviously be pretty wrong on that and it wouldn't be the most shocking thing but that's my expectation as a baseline at the moment and so I do think that's a little bit exciting especially if he gets on a line with Terry I think a guy like Alex Kaloran can make a lot of sense as a winger on that line uh, they've had some success running uh, setups similar to that so I'd be interested if something like that were to happen keep an eye out that could happen Zegers could be pretty interesting you have the Sunday off night this Sunday for Anaheim so you could look to add Zegers for that if he's available in your league Frank Vitrano just one goal in his last five skating over 19 minutes a night second in the league in shots per 60 over the last five while skating 19 plus a night that's good stuff from Frank Vitrano 21st in individual scoring chances four per 60 and this is where the teammate factor really comes in 229 in Corsi four per 60 262 in on ice scoring chances four per 60 Frank Vitrano getting absolutely no help whatsoever from any of his line mates now on pace for 35 goals and 59 points on the season uh, he's having a terrific season and honestly I, like I feel like this is not that far off from what we might be able to expect from Frank Vitrano it's regressed as of late but overall I think the numbers have dipped back down to where I kind of believe him as a 30 to 35 goal scorer and a 60-ish point guy uh, in this current iteration perhaps with like really great line mates like if you put him in Zuccarello's spot on the opposite wing of Kaprizov like what would Frank Vitrano do in that spot that'd be pretty interesting obviously pretty hard to know the answer to that but I bet it would be better than what What's going on in Anaheim at the moment? Overall, I'm not really looking to move off of Vitrano. It's pretty hard to do so when the underlying metrics, the individual metrics, look this good. You know, maybe he's the guy who gets the Zegris bump. Zegris comes back, and instead of being weighed down by Mason McTavish, suddenly he's being buoyed by some life and energy from a guy like Trevor Zegris. That's definitely within the realm of possibility here, and I'd be mildly excited about that for Frank Vitrano. If you have to drop them before the weekend, I definitely wouldn't fault you for that. But I'd be interested to pick him back up, especially if we do get some a look at some lines and he is with Zegris and not with McTavish moving forward. All right, back to some comments. Byron Starr in the chat debating between adding either Lilligren or Hannafin. I know Riley's back, so just wondering. Uh, yeah, so Lilligren has been, has been the guy in Toronto playing on the top power play unit for the last little bit and they seem to be relatively happy with that how it's going they're probably just kind of saving Morgan Riley for the playoffs I'd be kind of shocked if Lilligren was the guy in the playoffs but for fantasy purposes what do we care about the playoffs we care about what's going on right now and while it's working Lilligren's going to stay there so I do think that's a good look obviously Hannafin just gonna be on a good team skate a bunch of minutes he's not really uh, gonna be getting a ton of power play time Shea Theodore is the clear top power play guy there but Hannafin is getting a lot of even strength time so that's obviously a good spot I could throw 
these guys into a little comparison here for us uh, in the sheet. Hannafin versus Timothy Lilligren. Let's see if I can spell. There we go. Four assists in the last five for Lilligren, playing almost 22 minutes a night, which is good stuff. Hannafin playing 22 and a half plus. He's got two assists his last five. Hannafin's underlying numbers a little bit better on the individual side, but a little bit worse on the uh, on ice side. Lilligren getting obviously a pretty big boost. Seventh in Corsi, four per sixty, and twelfth in scoring chances, four per sixty amongst all defensemen in the last five games. Obviously, getting that boost from the Leafs power play uh, over this stretch of play. I think I'd take Lilligren at the moment. Uh, to be honest with you, Hannafin might be the safe play, but I'm looking for somebody to win me my week, not uh, you know edge me towards my week uh, if that makes any sense so i think i'd take Lilligren between the two at the moment i don't see a reason for them to move off it unless he you know there's always a chance he makes you know some boneheaded play at the line and they decide to Sheldon Keefe decides he's got to have the old reliable vet and morgan riley back there even though riley's been arguably not that reliable in some of these uh spots in the past so uh, that's obviously still a possibility but i do think that there's some rhyme to the reason with Lilligren being this guy at the moment I think they're just consciously taking minutes away from Riley at this point so as long as he's semi-competent there and he has been then I think Lilligren hangs on to that Jack Kane says Nate got into fantasy hockey at the beginning of the seasons and apples and Jones has been my go-to podcast all year thanks to you Blake and the rest of the A&G team for all the great content appreciate the kind words Jack uh it's really one of the main reasons we do what we do is we've gotten some really good feedback and uh, really kind feedback. Uh, I want to say it's uh, we've been very happy to be a part of the fantasy hockey community at large. Um, all the content creators that we've, you know, collaborated with in the past year and, and even before that, basically everybody that I've ever reached out to or had any kind of conversation with, it seems like uh, it's just full of uh, great people. So I'm really happy with the fantasy hockey community community and really happy obviously with all of our listeners and all of our patron members uh, yeah just a really great community i feel very blessed to to be able to talk into a microphone and we get thousands of listens and it's uh yeah it's just wild that people take us <laughs> this seriously uh, to be honest with you but we love to see it for sure throwing dave throwing up the heart in the chat Let's see you buddy all right, let's get back into it. I got to scroll back up. Uh, we wanted to talk about Rupe Hints. So Blake and I did talk about Rupe Hints in the flagship show. So that should be in your podcast feeds. Uh, it's up on YouTube. You can check that out. Um, we talked about him in the have not section of the last show. So you can go check out our take on Rupe Hints as well. Um, overall, like you see the underlying numbers are still pretty solid with Rupe Hints. 35th shots per 60, 56 individual scoring chances 4 per 60 61st Corsi 4 per 60 62nd scoring chances 4 per 60 I know the results have not been there as of late for Rupe Hints but it's still the Pavelski Hints Robertson top line it's still the Pavelski Hints Robertson Ben top power play the situation has not changed his underlying stats look really solid he's getting less minutes than you'd hope so that's going to put a little bit of a ceiling on what his point potential could be but I think there's also like every chance that Rupe Hints just kind of goes off this week and he ends up getting even more minutes because he's feeling it and that line's feeling it. I think that's well within the range of possibilities. I don't think he's like dogging it or anything. I don't think he's playing poorly. I think it's just a, just a cold stretch. He's getting a little bit unlucky. And what better way to bump a cold streak than playing the San Jose Sharks on Tuesday night here. So I'm watching that game. Uh, I'm going to call it right now. Baby Dry, Rupe hints two points against the Sharks on Tuesday night. You heard it here first, folks. All right, let's keep it rolling before I make too many hot takes on the podcast here. Joey Decord and Philip Grubauer, the Seattle tandem, was requested last week, requested again this week. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's dig into it. It's been uh, it's been a wild ride, that is for sure. Uh, it seemed like Grubauer was taking away some starts. Uh, he had a good stretch of starts and then uh, not so great stretch of starts. He was, well, not stretch of starts in the last game here uh, on Sunday against Montreal, he allowed four goals on six shots before being pulled against Montreal. Uh, that is just brutal stuff. First two shots went in. 
it didn't get better from there and against a team like Montreal uh, that is that is tough to stomach so it'll be very interesting to see what Seattle does this week they got two games in a row against Anaheim Tuesday Thursday like there's a chance that they just roll out Joey Decord for the next two games three games even and I'm like man we can't trust Grubauer because of this this outing that he had um, Decord obviously came into the game in relief uh, he did allow a goal, but he made 10 saves, so he definitely played better even in relief, uh, which is a tough spot to be in. And he had a not-so-bad game against Arizona the game before. It was two goals against on 26 shots, so that's not a terrible spot. You know, <laughs> it's, it's very, very hard to tell. Basically, I'd be looking very intently at who they start on Tuesday night. That would tell me who is going to get the two starts for the week. I think whoever gets the start on Tuesday will at least get... A, one of the Thursday or Saturday starts. So if both are available in your league, I'd just be waiting for that Tuesday news to drop and then I'd jump. If I had to hazard a guess right now, I do think that it would be Decord most likely to get the next two starts just because of how bad that Grubauer outing was on Sunday. Uh, Jeff in the chat, Rupe's been killing me. Still riding him this week in the semis, though. Time on ice seemed low, which was a little concerning. Yeah, the time on ice is the most concerning part of the profile, but overall, I think that's just kind of a product of Dallas. The other lines have been rolling, so they deprioritize the top line a little bit. If the top line starts rolling pretty hard and hints gets a couple points against San Jose, uh, then I think you could see it trend back the other way for a little bit. Um, I'd not too concerned if it grows to be a much more significant trend over a much longer period of time then that would be more of a concern for me all right next up jonathan drewin this is an interesting one for sure um yeah four games played here showing up on the sheet and he's got eight points in those four games including a two goal one assist outing in the last game against pittsburgh on sunday played 20 minutes 47 seconds the colorado avalanche do that if you did not know they absolutely play the bejesus out of their top players and when when you got a guy like Druin who's playing on a top line, they kind of did a weird thing. So they did move around the top lines. So Druin split time between the Ranton and McKinnon line and the Lekin and Middlestat line in the last game. Uh, I'd have to dig a little bit deeper to see which, which way they started and which way they finished. But regardless, he's still on the top power play, which is obviously a terrific spot to be in. The on-ice numbers look amazing for Druin. 20th in Corsi, 4 per 60. 24th on-ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. And quite honestly, like the uh, individual numbers, not bad. 154th in shots per 60. 72nd in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 for Jonathan Druin. On pace now for 17 goals, 55 points on the season. Um, it's a hot streak, right? Uh, it's the playoffs. You need people on hot streaks too. I'm okay to ride with it for a while, but, uh, if there's a change in deployment, if there's, uh, yeah, any kind of sign that he's fallen off the train a little bit here, then I would also not hesitate to drop Jonathan Druin as fast as I picked him up. So, uh, very volatile player in my mind. I don't mind trying to stay in the flames with a stream here, but I also would be treating it very, very carefully. Uh, Toronto Dave says Hyman having a season pop 50. Yeah, uh, three players so far with 50 goals on the season. Hyman, Reinhardt, and then Matthews. I think everybody expected Matthews. I'm not sure how many expected Hyman and Sam Reinhardt this year. Amon asks, yo, my guy, do I keep Lekkonen or Druin? Points League can only keep one of them. That is a really tough call. Um, at the moment, just based on deployment, I don't know how you go against Druin. Lekkonen playing on the second line with Middlestat and then either Druin or Nichushkin and then playing on a second power play unit. Uh, it's just going to be tough for Lekkonen to keep pace from that deployment. So I think you got to keep Druin at the moment if those are your two options. Uh, it could flip and that's just the chance you're running with Colorado at the moment. I mean, if you want to check lines uh, before tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's game, right? They're playing here on, yeah, they're playing the Canadians on Tuesday. If you want to check lines the morning of and make your decision then, maybe that's the way to do it. Unless you got to make an ad here tonight or make a drop here tonight to bring somebody off of IR or whatever the case may be. Uh, if you can, I would wait till tomorrow and try to get a look at the lines and see if anything's going to change for that game. Uh, but if it is the way that it is and Druin's the one on top power play overlacking in, I think you got to stick with the deployment. All right. 
Evander Kane is next on the list. One assist his last four games. He got a maintenance day in the back half of back-to-back in on the Sunday here. Still 45th in shots per 60, 66th individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Good numbers there. 135th, Corsi, 4 per 60, and 66th in uh, on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. Uh, Kane has been disappointing managers for a fair bit. It seems like uh, he's having a tough time just consistently staying in the top six this year. He hasn't had a goal, and this is too many games for me to count live on the air. Everyone would be extremely bored if I tried to do that. Uh, deployment's been all over the place. He's played anywhere between 21 minutes and 13, 39 uh, over this stretch of goalless play. It's hard, uh, it's hard to move off of Kane, especially in bangers formats, but it's also a spot where now you know he's a little bit banged up. Are they really going to prioritize him into the top six knowing that, give him more minutes? Um, that's a tough ask. Is he going to hit as much given that he's a little bit banged up? That's a, that's a tough question to answer as well. And are you really going to be playing him this week? when the Oilers play Winnipeg uh, and LA and Anaheim on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, all heavy nights. Is Kane actually cracking your starting lineup is the third question. So a lot of strikes against Kane at the moment. I mean, you can drop Kane. I do think that there's a really solid chance, a really solid chance uh, that Kane is pretty, pretty entrenched as a really good option after this week but like basically for the rest of the fantasy hockey playoffs especially if you play in week 26 uh, not just next week but the week after like all the way to the end of the nhl regular season basically then the edmonton oiler schedule is really solid and you're gonna evander kane will probably be one of the priority ads out on your waiver wire uh, but that can't really influence too much what you're deciding to do for this week to maximize your chances of winning this week and so if kane is that guy who's going to be riding the pine this week and you do have an option to move off even if it's for just a really good goalie stream that you find somewhere in the week then i wouldn't hesitate to do that all right, we've already talked about Troy Terry. We've already talked about Trevor Zegras. Let's talk about Brad Marchand. Four assists in his last five games here, of averaging about 18.45 a night through this stretch. The Boston Bruins have been mixing up the lines a little bit. So in the last game, it was Marchand, Coyle, DeBrusque. Uh, that's an interesting setup. That leaves Pasternak to skate with Zaka and Danton Heinen. Uh, obviously, Marshawn's still on the top power play. I don't think anybody's coming for that deployment anytime soon. Uh, we did get practice lines, and the practice lines were the same. So it is Marshawn, Coyle, DeBrusque, and that's what you should expect to see uh, Tuesday when they play again. I, I, I can't see doing anything with Marshawn, to be quite honest with you. Shots per 60, 212. Individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 179. On ice, Corsi 4, 233. On ice, scoring chances for 138. It's not great. It's not where you want it to be, for sure. Um, but overall, I can't imagine that there's really somebody out there, especially if you have a spot for Marshawn on Tuesday. You're getting the Wednesday off night. That's a good thing for your lineup, and that's going to free up somebody on your Thursday heavy night. Um, Marshawn is just a good thing for your lineup right now, and I don't think that he's playing too poorly to consider dropping him even beyond this. Uh, like, I'm struggling to think who in most of my leagues that I'd be playing over Marshawn, um, even in like, uh, even in like a shallower league, it would be hard for me to find somebody. Uh, yeah, I'm just really struggling to think about who I'm going to play him below come, uh, yeah, come Saturday when you're already sitting there with a lot of, uh, a lot of players that are probably going to be streamer level that you played early in the week, like Buffalo guys, like Jordan Greenway, not playing him over Brad Marchand. Are you playing, um, any of these other random streamers that you picked up through the week over Brad Marchand? Probably not. So I think Brad Marchand is a hold, uh, Charlie McAvoy is a little bit more interesting. Uh, he's the next player up here. He's got zero points his last five. I'm going to check this because he has zero points, uh, going back a long way. I I gotta see how far back this one really goes with Charlie McAvoy because he has been on my radar as a have not for quite some time. 
this goes way back. This is a 10-game pointless streak for Charlie McAvoy. The shots have really fallen off. He's way down the list in terms of defenseman shots. The on-ice numbers are respectable. Well, barely respectable, I guess you would say. Um, really not great stuff for McAvoy overall. Still pacing for 54 points on the season, but getting some heavy regression and well-deserved because he has not been playing all that well by the metrics. So that is a tough spot. I, I'm... Again, it's a hard spot to say, like, who are you picking up who has the deployment where he could just pop off, even if he's not playing well, he could just pop off on the power play and run into, like, four assists in a random night. Um, that's well within the range of outcomes here. They play Florida, Tampa Bay, and then Washington this week. It's not the greatest setup, but it's also not the worst uh, week that I've ever seen. Um, you know, if somebody were to come to me, uh, hit me up and give me who you would actually be looking to add. Like, say you play McAvoy for Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you really don't want to play him, uh, hang on to him till the Saturday. Who would you realistically be moving on from McAvoy for? If you're going to just say, like, a few random goalie streams, uh, unless it's, like, a really great goalie stream, I don't know that I'm really inclined to do that. The one thing that does work in favor of a drop is that Boston only plays three games, zero off nights next week as well. And that's Nashville, Carolina, Florida, which are all pretty solid teams. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying you can't drop Charlie McAvoy. I'm saying it would have to be a fairly compelling reason why. I don't think that McAvoy is a guy that I'm dropping for Jordan Greenway, for example. All right, let's get back to some comments. Jeff said, I dropped like an in for Druen this week, YOLOing. Uh, good stuff. Uh, let's see how it goes. Hopefully that works out. Monsen, thank you for answering the question about like an in versus Druen. By far the best source for all things hockey fantasy. Appreciate you. And Lenny says, in semis right now, have Freddie Anderson and someone dropped Kachikov. Is it worth making a waiver claim and holding the tandem rest of the way? My other goalie is Hill, who is out now. It's an interesting spot. If you're in a Cats League and you need to make some goalie minimums, then you are going to have to really think about picking up a goalie here. I think that if if the you know if the recent uh, kind of one-off goalie system holds in Carolina, basically they've been playing Kachikov, then Anderson, then Kachikov, then Anderson, uh, just going back and forth, um, ping-ponging it back and forth this whole time. Uh, true tandem situation if that holds then Kachikov would get the two starts this week so I'm not sure when or if he comes off waivers or how that works in your specific league but if Kachikov does come off waivers uh, on or before tomorrow the 26th Tuesday and you can get him in and he does get the start for the Tuesday game against Pittsburgh and then he also gets the Saturday against Montreal that's a pretty enticing pickup uh, just for a week so I would intend uh, entertain that pickup for that week and then I might honestly drop them after that even if I did pick them up let's look at Carolina's schedule yeah the following week Carolina only plays three games so I think I'd probably drop Kachikov after that but assuming that Kachikov the the uh, tandem system does hold and Kachikov does get the Tuesday start uh, yeah I don't hate picking up Kachikov uh, especially with those two opponents the way that they're playing I think I'd be pretty into that Michael Radzuon asks, will Creamer win the Listener's Yahoo League? I have the ability to see this. I don't know if everybody in the Listener League knows, but I, I do have a uh, a co-manager situation where I can just kind of see. I haven't touched anything in there all year, but uh, I can see Blake's team and I can see how things are going. He did finish first, which is just terrible. I'm sure he's... Uh, <laughs> he's lording that over everyone uh he's got a solid team i will say it's a it's a strong bet uh i don't know what the odds are what the betting odds are in the league but uh i think he's got to be the odds on favorite for sure um interesting some interesting streamer choices uh but i'll leave it at that uh, i can't i can't give blake too much credit uh when he's not here you know i just can't do it can't bring myself to do it all right let's keep rolling Let's talk about Philip Kurashev. Two goals, six points in his last five, 19 minutes average time on ice. On ice metrics are okay. 132nd, Corsi 4 per 60, 43rd scoring chances 4 per 60. That's all right, but uh, as per Philip Kurashev's usual, 243rd shots per 60, 184th individual scoring chances 4 per 60. It's not great. 
Uh, it never will be for Philip Kirchev. I just don't think he's that dude. They did kind of mix up the lines a little bit, which is my major concern right now. They played a Felino Dickinson Bedard line a fair bit. They also played a Tyler Johnson Kirchev Bedard line. So that's really what I want to be monitoring over the next little bit. I don't know if we've got an update in practice lines from today. It looks like we do. It looks like it was Donato Bedard Kirchev in practice today. That's uh, that's good. As Basically, you need that exposure. Uh, Philip Kurashev is not interesting in his own. He has to be playing with Bedard for me to be any have any interest in him whatsoever, regardless of how many points he scored in the last little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, Kurashev is interesting, but again, it's a Chicago situation where there's not much benefit to rostering a Chicago player this week. It's not a good schedule for them. You're not going to get extra games played. They play Calgary, Ottawa, Philadelphia this week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, all on heavy nights. I believe, if I remember correctly, they do not have a great schedule next week either. Yeah, they play Tuesday, Saturday, Sunday, which, I mean, it could be worse, but it could be better. Uh, yeah, if you hold them through the Tuesday, are you really hanging on through three days without a game to get to the Saturday, Sunday? I feel like that's probably not a not a play that most people are going to make i think khrushchev is probably a drop for a lot of people this week especially if he's just going to be warm in your bench richard asked does Suter get a bump with lindholm out uh, i don't think like i think Suter kind of already had that bump uh, to be honest with you i think he was playing above him in the lineup uh, lindholm was really just being a 3c uh, but they did in the warm-up uh, i just saw this now it actually just came through not that long ago it looks like Suter is centering what amounts to the fourth line with the silly putt colson and nils Amon. that's not a great spot to be uh yeah that's not what we wanted to see for sure uh but we'll have to see there's still the power play question is he still on the top power play um yeah we'll just have to see basically i have suitor in a couple places because yeah there's not a lot to pick from there it looked like he had the miller besser deployment that's going to pdg right now so if that's your situation moving forward then maybe you know giuseppe becomes a little bit more interesting to you i don't know if that's going to hold either that's up for debate as well um i'm i'm really curious about the power play uh but i think i'm pr very likely to be moving on from Suter after this one game here tonight hopefully he manages to get something for us this uh as a stream for this monday but there's a pretty good chance that i am moving on from him just because it's hard to hold on especially through a thursday if you're not going to be playing him are you going to hang on to him for five games for five nights rather where he's not doing anything for you he could be that roster spot that you need to open up and just you know stream some goalies or whatever you need to do to get some games played get some points this week so that's my approach with Suter at the moment we already talked about Vetrano so let's talk about Jake Ottinger um, Ottinger and Wedgwood have been the combo there Lately, it's been all Ottinger, and it has been all pretty good. He's won his last three starts. He's allowed only two goals in each of those last three starts. He hasn't had to face a ton of shots. The most shots he's had to face in any of those games was 28. The least was 22, so fairly consistent. Dallas, obviously a great team. He's going to... Yeah, he's going to have uh, a pretty solid setup in front of him most nights. So I think I'm just kind of riding it out with Ottinger at the moment. Uh, it hasn't been a great season, for sure. I mean, everybody tried to tell me what a what a sure thing Jake Ottinger was this year, and yet here we are uh, going into week 24, and Jake Ottinger has an 898 save percentage on the season for a terrific team in the Dallas Stars. So um, goalies, uh, they'll do that to you. So, uh, But at the moment, if you got Ottinger on the roster, I think you're holding. I think he's playing pretty well. I don't see really any reason to be doing anything different than just running Ottinger out there night after night at the moment. Shabbat is the last player that was requested that got some love in the Apples and Jews Discord server, which, if you haven't already joined, check the link in the description. You can join the Apples and Jews Discord server and start chatting with, like, I think we're up to 1,100-ish uh, members at the moment. So join in there, talk some fantasy hockey playoffs, uh, bemoan your losses, and celebrate your wins with us. That's what we're all doing at this point in the season. Shabbat here, though, two goals, five 
five points in his last five games, 21 and a half minutes, average time on ice. Obviously, that looks all right for Thomas Shabbat. 39 shots per 60, 36 in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 127 in Corsi, 4 per 60, and 40th in on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. He's not been getting top power play. That's been Chikrin and Sanderson. So it's been a two defense top power play unit for Ottawa as of late. And Shabbat has not been a part of that. So obviously, that's not great. But Shabbat has been producing regardless, which is pretty good. So uh, on the season, pacing for 15 goals, 52 points. I feel like the 52-point pace is right about where we expect Shabbat to be. Um, that might feel a little bit aggressive. He does have an 11.6% on ice shooting percentage on the season, which is pretty high. And definitely... Uh, this last little stretch he's not playing anywhere near like the 26 plus minutes that he used to play back when the senators had no defenseman other than thomas shabbat to play um yeah i mean shabbat is a fine defenseman i think that he's decently valuable do i think that he's going to continue some point per game play without in the top power play exposure no i did not I think that Shabbat is a fine uh, third or fourth defenseman on most fantasy rosters in most formats. I just think he's a relatively unexciting player, and it wouldn't shock me if he went through a bit of a cold stretch over the next little bit. Um, the metrics are fine. I'm not like predicting that because of metrics. I'm just saying that you know I don't think this recent stretch of play is anything to get too too excited about, unless really the deployment changes and he gets a lot more top power play time and just more time in general in order to run into some more points so shabbat just a little bit ho-hum not too excited one way or the other all right i think we made it to the end of the list let's do a brief check-in with the score we've got a one nothing vegas lead at the moment let's see who scored the goal it's pavel Dorofiev because of course it is anthony matho with an assist and zach whitecloud uh, with the other so that's obviously helping everyone who streamed those guys uh, i mean i guess some people might have streamed in uh, a mantha perhaps maybe uh, but yeah overall not too much to get excited about i mean i can't i can't say anything i streamed in keegan colasar and i streamed in nicholas Roy in a spot um yeah i can't really say anything can i i'm a little bit of a hypocrite in that regard either way i think we've reached the end of our time together so that's going to be all that i've got for this episode hopefully it brought you some value helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today all the advanced stats you heard today came from natural statric which is a terrific free resource many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for the podcast be sure to check out their spotify as well and that's it folks much love